Let's take a look at how to properly design a database and cover some of the most important database design principles. What makes a good database design? Well, there are two golden rules that we need to follow. And if we do, the end result will be a database that performs well, doesn't take up as much storage, won't cause us problems down the road, and contains high quality data. Golden rule number one is we want to avoid duplicate and redundant information. This can cause all kinds of chaos within our database. Number one, it increases storage because we're storing the same data multiple times. Number two, it reduces data quality because there's a chance that someone will modify that data in one place, not in another, which will result in inaccuracies. Here's a good example. Let's say that we wanted to track customers, their orders, and the products that they ordered. Very, very common database in today's world. So here, we jam all of that information into a single table. And look at the result. We have duplicate information here, 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 and here. Every single one of these columns contains duplicate information somewhere. This is why it's important during the design phase to properly identify those distinct entities. For example, here, these two columns, these are associated with the customer. This column is associated with the product, and this one is associated with orders. So what that tells us here is we should really have three tables rather than a single table. So breaking these out into three tables will eliminate all of that duplicate data, and then we can add our primary keys and foreign keys and set up our relationship links between them so we can still write queries that return this view to our users and our applications and anyone using this data. But under the hood, it's only stored once. Designing your database in such a way will get us half of the way here with the next golden rule, which is around data quality, ensuring accuracy and completeness of our data. Another way to accomplish this is using what are known as constraints. Constraints are things that we place on columns. So we have things like default constraints, which if a value isn't supplied in an insert statement, then a value will automatically be applied, the default value that we define in that constraint. A common one there is using the get date function in SQL, tying it to like an order date column. So when that record is entered, when an order is placed, it'll automatically fill in the current date. Another one is a check constraint. A check constraint is used to ensure a valid range of values within a column is entered. Another kind of constraint, which we covered in a previous nugget, is a foreign key constraint, which enforces relationships between multiple tables. Here's a more complete design of customers, products, and orders. Notice that each one of these tables only contains information about that entity and nothing more. And we set up relationships through primary keys and foreign keys between all of these tables. So can you identify the primary keys in all of these tables and the foreign keys in all of these tables? Let's try it. Primary key for customers table is the customer ID. I know the little key icon gives it away there. For the products table, it's product ID. For the orders table, it's order ID. And for the order details table, it's actually both of these order ID and product ID. That's known as a composite primary key because it is the combination of both of these columns. Now, can you identify the foreign keys? I see one right here, customer ID. This is a foreign key because it references a primary key in another table, customer ID. This ensures that the customer must exist in order to place an order, right? So we couldn't just put an order in here that didn't have a customer, a valid customer that exists in this table associated with it. The other one is down here in the order details table. This product ID references the primary key of product ID in the products table. This ensures that orders can only be placed on valid products. Now let's talk about the design process because a good majority of it is actually just attempting to identify everything that you need to track and how you're gonna structure it in the database. Actually doing it, building it, is the easy part. Step number one, and this kinda goes without saying, but identify the purpose of your database. Now when you're learning this stuff, you can have fun with it. One of my first databases was, was tracking all of my music. So I identified everything that I wanted to store, artists, albums, tracks, and then all the data points within there. And that leads us into step number two here, which is to discover and collect information. Whatever it is you want to store, just gather all the potential data points, and then you can organize them by entity into tables. I really enjoy this part of the design process, and you can actually do this anytime anywhere. You can look at a real world object and try to extract all the data points off of it. In fact, I do this when I'm bored. <laughs> I, I did this the other day. I was sitting in the doctor's office, bored out of my skull because the magazines were like 20 years old and I wasn't going to read them. So I'm like, you know what? 
While I'm sitting here, I'm going to turn this room into a database. And I just looked around, and I noticed pictures, lots of pictures on the wall. So I'm like, there's a table right there, a pictures table. Now, what kind of information can I extract from a picture? Well, the height, the width, the frame style, the artist, and then what the picture actually is, maybe a description of the picture or notes about the picture. So all that information could be stored inside of a table. In fact, as a fun little exercise, you can do this right now. Look around wherever you are, zero in on an object, and start identifying all the data points that you would want to track in a database about that object. This is how database developers think. Now, obviously, looking at an object isn't going to give you everything you need, which is why there's always a lot of research involved in this phase and also talking to other people. The next step is to take all that information you gathered about all the objects you want to store and transform them into tables. Then take all of those data points and transform them into columns within those tables. From there, you'll want to identify your primary keys within those entities to enforce uniqueness within a table, and then your foreign keys to set up relationships between those objects. The last step in the design process is to normalize and refine your database design. Now, normalization is a very important database design concept that is just a set of rules and guidelines. And if we follow them, the end result will be these golden rules right here. We will completely eliminate redundant data and increase data quality. Normalization consists of what are called five normal forms, and they all build on each other. So the first pass through of your database design, you'll attempt to get the first normal form, then second normal form, then third normal form. And that's, that's really where most folks go today is just the third normal form. That's all you need to hit these golden rules. In this CBT nugget, we covered the basics of database design. I hope this has been informative for you, and I'd like to thank you for viewing.